So this first conversation you'll see in your program is titled The Moral Citizen. And I've given you a taste of perhaps what I mean to explore here when I describe this intersection of power and character. But the reason why we wanted to begin this morning with this topic was to ground ourselves and our work in a discussion of values. And the very idea of what a moral citizen is, what, what we mean by moral and what we mean by citizen is something that we will unpack uh, in this conversation. Uh, but I, am, I feel very blessed to have this group of four luminaries with us to open up this discussion. So let me introduce them uh, briefly. You have their biographies and information in your programs. But uh, uh, joined first here uh, by Yusur Ghazi, who is a uh, leader and consultant at the Interfaith Youth Corps, an organization we'll hear a lot more about, uh, and also um, in ways that I'll want to be interested to explore with you, um, uh, has a role uh, at the U.S. Department of State right now um, in work that is similarly about um, interfaith, international connection. To her left is Jim Wallace, Reverend Jim Wallace, founder and longtime head and leader of an organization called Sojourners, which is, by my lights, the country's most effective and widespread and prominent network of people who are at the intersection of faith and progressive politics. And Jim is the author of many books that explore not only that intersection, but these different dimensions of values and civic morality. Next, and really very recently um, with us, Tara Hauska is a leading native activist here in the United States. And I say recently back from Standing Rock, where she spent the last six months as one of the main leaders of of that resistance work, which continues, uh, even if not from Standing Rock, and is a uh, lawyer, an activist, uh, and catalyst extraordinaire. And then last but not least, uh, one of uh, actually at least two certified geniuses in the room, uh, <laughs> certified by our friends at the MacArthur Foundation, uh, a Genius Fellow uh, Award winner, uh, Bob Woodson, who is uh, the longtime director and head of an organization called Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, uh, which has been working for decades in cities around the United States to organize low-income, often African-American communities in neighborhoods often plagued with violence, to rebuild economic, civic, moral, communal capacity. So I want to begin here with a common question for all of you and invite each of you just to speak to this question for three minutes or so so that when we, then we can open up a wider conversation here. But the, the very simple initial question that I want to pose when we think about the idea of the moral core of showing up in civic life, the moral core of citizenship. One of the things that strikes me that that means is dignity. That whatever faith tradition, whatever political positions, whatever background you might have, that one notion of morality in civic life is to recognize the dignity of other people, but indeed of oneself. And the question I'd love to hear you each speak to initially is just whether it's on dignity or some other dimension, in your work, how do you activate this moral dimension of citizenship? And we'll start with you, Yusra. 
Great, thank you so much, Eric. Um, and thank you all for being here today. It's a real privilege to be a part of this conversation with such an esteemed panel, but also uh, the great inspiring roster of speakers as part of the conference this year. Um, you heard from Eric that I am um, affiliated with the Interfaith Youth Corps. It's a Chicago-based organization. I'm also a policy advisor at the US Department of State in the Office of Religion and Global Affairs. And I'll start off by um, uh, giving my required uh, disclaimer that uh, the views and opinions I'm sharing today um, are my own, that they don't represent the US Department of State. Um, and I'm very much here. <laughs> I'm that was not meant to be a joke, but thank you anyway. <laughs> I'm very much showing you today wearing my um, personal hat, my interfaith leader hat or hijab, if you will, and, um, and would like to uh, address this question about the moral core of civic life um, by talking about uh, how, I, how I perceive this concept. And I think it has um, much to do with interfaith encounter and interfaith action. I won't start too far back because I know I only have a few minutes, but I grew up uh, as a Muslim Pakistani girl in Skokie, Illinois just north of Chicago. And I, um, by virtue of being a religious minority, came into contact with uh, people of all kinds of religious and non-religious, cultural, ethnical, uh, ethnic backgrounds, and uh, came to understand my uh, religious identity and um, informed my worldview in contradistinction with the others that I grew up around, and often as a result of having to answer questions about why it is that I fast during the month of Ramadan or why I excuse myself in certain gatherings to pray during a particular time of the day. And so all of this helped shape the way that I think about my moral compass, the things that uh, I, um, the values that are important to me as a Muslim American. And so, um, when I first learned about an organization, Interfaith Youth Corps, that works on pulling together religiously diverse young people to have conversations about shared values, it was uh, not necessarily my first interfaith encounter, but it was one that was strikingly different from all the other interfaith encounters I was exposed to through my mosque community. So rather than entering a room with a panel of mostly older gentlemen, sometimes with beards, sometimes with less hair on top. Um, I was entering into interfaith conversations with young people my age, uh, young leaders in high school and colleges, and having conversations about values that are near and dear to me as a Muslim American, values like hospitality and service and, and giving and, and, and um, common understanding with people from diverse backgrounds. It was through organizations like Interfaith Youth Corps that I first started to think about what does Islam say about service? What does Islam say about helping the other? Um, that's the kind of stuff that they didn't teach me in Sunday school that, you know, and one of the reasons why, frankly, I was quite bored going to Sunday school every Sunday, um, but I was learning about my own values through this new language and through this new interfaith lens. That's really at the heart of um, the approach of Interfaith Youth Corps, uh, equipping young people with the opportunities on college and university campuses to have these types of conversations about uh, shared values, common values, but also creating spaces to have some of the tougher, uh, challenging conversations about issues that matter to them. And um, again, what, made, what makes the Interfaith Youth Corps approach different is that um, it is centered around identifying these values and then acting on them through interfaith action pro projects that address a variety of issues that are relevant or important to a particular community. And so I'll finish by saying that uh, this is not a unique thing on college and university campuses across the country. In my time uh, living in the Middle East and also now working at the US Department of State, I've come across really inspiring examples of religious leaders, women, and young people who are addressing some of the biggest issues of our day through interfaith uh, encounter and interfaith action. And Eric, you, um, in your book, you're more powerful than you think. You talk about cultivating habits of cooperation in every circle of our lives. And that's also a, a major part of how I think about this interfaith encounter. And so I'm, I'm happy to talk more about this and also eager to learn from the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Yusra. Um, Bob, when we first met um, in person, um, I think I was coming um, perhaps straight from uh, a meeting at the Obama White House, and you had, uh, just in the weeks prior, uh, been counseling Speaker Paul Ryan uh, on questions of uh, urban poverty and renewal. Um, and our first conversations started from this vantage point of 
um, as I was saying earlier today, let's meet each other, right? And we found in that initial conversation how we've become friends is meeting each other on certain values dimensions that matter in the dignified life of anybody trying to renew any scale of community. And so I don't know whether your answer to the question about the moral core of citizenship um, resides more in a faith language or maybe in a not particularly religious language, but just more a um, you know, civic responsibility language. But I'd be interested to hear your take on this question. I'm, I'm explicit, explicitly religious <laughs> in my perspective. Any black is anything but a Baptist. Someone's been messing with him. <laughs> okay, with that in mind, uh, let, let me see. I, I have spent the bulk of my life trying to convince people that low-income people have agency, that they've got the capacity to think and act for themselves. And my biggest pushback is, is fundamental intellectual elitism. People both left and right of center tend to believe that untutored people are unwise, in many cases immor uh, amoral, and therefore incapable of making informed decisions about themselves. So I hear a lot of talk about the poor and those that are on the outside without allowing them to speak for themselves. And so what I spent a lot of time, and I'll, and I'll use a story, there, uh, uh, some years ago, there was an executive director of a woman's shelter, and each year volunteers would collect toys and at Christmas give them to the kids. Everyone was happy except the parents. The executive director, in her wisdom, decided that that had to change. And so what she did was permit these women to work and earn toy vouchers by volunteering, doing different work. And then they would collect the toys and put them in the store. And at Christmas time, the mothers shopped for the kids themselves. And it was the mothers who gave these toys to the kids, recognizing that, that reciprocity is fundamental to dignity. But what we do with the poor is we do things for them. We make assumptions about them without giving them the capacity or the opportunity to speak and act for themselves. And so I think dignity comes from that, that kind of uh, mm -hmm. expectation and treatment of those. This is actually a, a, a very apt opportunity for me to mention, uh, you know, all of our breakout sessions and breakout leaders um, are like all of our children. We love them equally. However, I want to highlight one breakout in particular, which is going to be led by the families from FII, the Family Independence Initiative. Um, uh, and I believe some of them are in the house already here. Um, and yeah, okay, so FII, um, as we'll hear about, uh, um, is an organization um, uh, that operates quite on the principles that Bob, you just described. Um, and these are, this is an organization of um, low-income families from around the United States who have been organizing themselves for economic and civic agency, voice, and dignity and showing people in ways that sort of break left-right boxes of what one is to expect about things um, uh, to create bottom-up citizen power. So that's going to be, they'll, they'll be leading one of the sessions this afternoon. Um, Tara, when we met in person just the other night, you were saying just, uh, you know, your, your mind was still in a little bit of uh, um, you know, alternate universe d d displacement shock of um, having spent many months uh, on the ground at Standing Rock um, and then uh, being back in, um, you know, I guess the world that's not Standing Rock, um, however you want to define that. Um, as you've been processing that, and I don't know how that has colored the way you would want to answer this question of the moral core of, of civic action. Um, and what is that you've learned in these, uh, these last months uh, um, on that question? Bridge everyone. Terra Indigenous Cause Jaganashi Mung Minawa Jaboy Kwe Indigenous Cause Anishinaabeg Mung Makwan Dudame Kudjing and Dunjaba. My name is Terra Huska. I'm Bear Clan. I was born in, or I'm Kudjing First Nation. I was born under the Maple Sapping Moon. I think it's always important to acknowledge the indigenous people around us and among us. So I always like to open with that. Um, you know, I think this this kind of shock and this displacement of coming from Standing Rock and coming from a situation in which, um, you know, it was a very apparent 
um, direct relationship of corporations controlling our, our governments and the um, you know, elevation of, of profit interest over human beings and um, the violence enacted on indigenous people. That has, that has been a narrative this country has founded upon. Um, that kind of shock of coming out of that situation um, is one that you know, I've encountered again and again. Um, when I first began as an attorney, um, just a couple years ago actually, I, worked, I, I moved to Washington DC and worked for um, a Native American law firm and it was my first encounter ever of seeing the Washington Redskins and really seeing it, you know, just being surrounded by it. Um, and understanding that, you know, when I went to work, when I would go on Capitol Hill and hear these conversations about these savage natives and the kangaroo court systems we have and how we're not sophisticated and how, um, you know, we're not able to manage our own affairs, that was when I saw, you know, this real understanding in the United States of a lack of real um, recognition of indigenous people that we still exist today, this false narrative that we died out. Um, and this, you know, basically a, a mindset which is lacking acknowledgement of the truth. You know, we're sitting in front of this flag right now and that means very different things to indigenous people. Um, you know, we serve at very, very high rates in the military with the highest group of demographic um, yet we are also the highest demographic that's most likely to be killed by police. We are also the demographic that is, you know, twice as likely as any other American to experience violence. And this flag means very different things to indigenous people. Um, so I think in all of the work I do, and, um, you know, I, I really hope that it came through. I was also a Native American advisor to Bernie Sanders. I got a chance to write a policy platform that reflected upholding treaty rights and that reflected um, acknowledging all demographics because every single voice, every single vote matters. Um, whether you're indigenous, whether you're Muslim, you know, any demographic matters. So I always try to approach um, everything I do with justice and morals in mind. I think we all should. So this notion that um, is implicit in everything that you all do, but Tara has just made explicit about justice um, at the core of any moral core uh, of citizenship. Uh, Jim, uh, your, your work has um, been in so many ways about uh, justice, but not justice uh, in, in a vacuum. Uh, justice connected to um, profound self-reflection. Um, you were telling uh, me and others yesterday about a pledge and a project that you're getting off the ground now called Matthew 25, and, um, and, and that may be something you want to uh, explain either now or, or, or a little bit later, but I, I, again, the, the the intersection of justice and empathy, the ways in which the lack of recognition of group X is a problem that can be applied to the lack of recognition for group Y or group Z, and that this, you know, the, the, the common term now of intersectionality, but I think the less academic term of uh, simply the humanity <laughs> of all of these different ways that we oppress one another um, has been at the heart of the work you've been doing at Sojourners uh, to I illuminate that humanity. And uh, for you, again, what's the moral core of civic life that you uh, focus your energies on? Well, thanks, Eric, for inviting me to this great assembly and for wanting the contributions from faith communities. Uh, uh, I listened very hard and carefully yesterday and last night, I was up late, too, just scribbling a lot of reflections. I never bring notes, but I just did this last night. Let me just start with this notion of the moment many were speaking of, or time. During the apartheid struggle, the black churches of South Africa named a biblical word for special times. The word is kairos, kairos different than chronos, which is normal time. Kairos is a moment time is elongated and becomes something more than just tick-tock, tick-tock, where we make choices, fundamental choices, and in, in the language of the faithful, that God can use to make big changes. Kairos times. Uh, I was thinking last night about that, and I think this is really a kairos moment in this nation's history. And the choices we make are really fundamental. 
And your question about dignity just brought a phrase to mind just in my head here. Uh, the choice we've got to make now are about, I would call, our disparity of dignities. Disparity of dignity. Like, the faith community talks about dignity a lot. But we're convening next Wednesday at the Capitol with the health care bill was going to come up and the budget is out. We've got the Catholic bishops, we've got the National Association of Evangelicals, National Council of Churches, heads of denominations. We picked a few women who are there, not many there. African American, Hispanic, we've got a broad, broad cross-section to declare a phrase that was coined by the faith community, a budget is a moral document. It reveals priorities. And so we're going to say together across all these boundaries, for example, that, uh, that we won't accept cutting meals on wheels to increase military spending. <laughs> you know? But I got to tell you, I got to tell you, this is, a, this is kind of an intimate gathering here. I got to tell you, it is really hard to get the leaders of denominations, and institutions, all those faith people to come together around that kind of common ground. It really is a difficult task. We, we're going to succeed next week. It's going to be a big deal. But it wasn't easy. The disparity of dignity. And let me just say, I'm, you asked about, to Bob, the, the religious. I'm going to go theological here. Uh, just if I can for a moment as a faith leader. So a colleague of mine, a black professor, always tells me, he asks his white students to tell them if they ever heard racism preached from their church pulpits as a sin. And the answer is always, almost always, no. No. So as you know, some of us say that racism was America's original sin. And when I sp think of the reckoning that you were talking about, we can't really get to that with going down to what that really was. And it's too easy, I'll speak as a white person, for white people to think the sin was coloni colonization and slavery. And it goes much deeper than that. It was a de deliberate dehumanization of indigenous people and kidnapped Africans. And we Christians, I'm a Christian, we're the, we're the ones who said, you can't really do to these people what we're doing to them if you believe they are human beings made in the image of God. So we'll take that away. We'll take away their humanity and say they weren't made in the image of God. We threw away Imago Dei. At the founding of the nation, we threw away Im Imago Dei. So the only response to sin in my scriptures, and Islamic and Jewish too, is repentance. Now, it's also too easy for white folks to say that means feeling sorry or guilty. Repentance, the word means to turn around and go in a whole new direction. Now, that means personally and systemically, economic systems, educational systems, criminal justice systems. So, so uh, rather than like Standing Rock, Tara, I was struck by how, how the indigenous community wasn't just speaking as the nation's original oppressed group, but was acting as stewards again of the nation and the planet and really offering prophetically to the, all the rest of us the choices we have to make if we're going to, to go forward. So to me, we got to get down to this disparity of dignity at the foundation of this nation and how to repent of that. So th th this phrase, um, I, I want to return in a moment, and indeed even after our panel uh, concludes to the Kairos versus Kronos notion of the elasticity or concentration of time. Um, but this, this phrase of the, 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 this disparity of dignity, um, Yusra, I mean, the, the interfaith work that you're doing in communities and campuses around the country right now, um, you know, when Interfaith Youth Corps got started, um, it was a somewhat different civic and civic religious environment. Um, there is such a heightened sense of both tension and fear um, across lines of faith. 
um, where there are some Christians who fear uh, Muslim invasion. There are Muslims feeling completely oppressed uh, uh, by Christians or by the state. There are Jews whose uh, uh, landmarks and um, uh, gathering places are being desecrated. Uh, there, so in this moment right now where um, not only do we have disparities of dignity, we have actually m much farther that kind of um, crossfire of intentional uh, indignity, right? Um, how does your work now change? Does it pivot to, um, well, h how does your work change? Eric, I don't know, um, I don't know if the work changes necessarily in the, in the way that it is modeled, but I think the, um, the, the, there is a lot more um, reckoning and honesty about, uh, about real challenges that divide uh, misunderstandings, lack of religious literacy that divide our communities across the country. So whereas when I first started, um, when I first got involved in Interfaith Youth Corps, I was still in high school. <laughs> so um, now I'm like dating myself. But um, I was very young and um, in, in sort of, um, approached my interfaith work more in the kumbaya sense of the word and um, you know just wanted to spend all my days talking about love and hospitality kindness and mercy and how how much I have in common with everyone um, different from me in my community in my school um, what what I'm noticing uh, among the students in Interfaith Youth Corps Network now is that they are grappling with uh, much deeper issues that I can recall grappling with, um, issues of intersectionality and how you can't you know, put aside your racial, ethnic, cultural identity and talk only about faith, religion, and, um, and moral values. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there is a lot more reckoning and honesty happening across campuses and communities across the country that are involved with Interfaith Youth Corps other interfaith initiatives and recognition that um, we we can um, we can learn from each other grow our religious literacy and understand each other while in service together uh, at a particular community center or when um, tutoring young people at the uh, local educational institution but we also have to recognize places um, and instances in which we uh, misunderstand each other, places where we offend each other and, and still try to find some common ground and common understanding. So uh, it's the practice of um, building up mutual dignity and mutual loyalty that takes time. And I see lots of inspiring young people, not to mention uh, the young people that I've met in my time here with the uh, Youth Collaboratory and uh, uh, the Citizen University Fellows who are doing this work in their own lives. And so uh, I see that now, as compared to when I first got involved in interfaith work, there's a lot more honesty and reckoning with um, the parts of our lives that we wouldn't necessarily bring um, at the start of interfaith conversations. They're finding their ways into interfaith work today. You know, one of the things that's interesting when you talk about that kind of, that kind of reckoning, um, and, and this notion that Jim alluded to in passing about Standing Rock and, and, and stewardship, right? Uh, it, Tara, w one of the things that was notable um, for those of us who never managed to get to Standing Rock to, to join uh, in the work there um, was the uh, apparently uh, large number and very vocal and visible presence of veterans um, from this generation's wars um, who came to be seen, heard, and join in the, uh, in the work of resistance there. And, um, uh, and that to me was an interesting, that was interesting um, on a couple of different levels. Uh, but one of the, the, the kind of moral core of why they were showing up there um, wasn't just, hey, we fought for this uh, nation um, uh, and we don't want to see this nation uh, despoiled in this way, but that there was something else that was going a little bit deeper than that, right? Uh, uh, that was about saying, hey, uh, we may be coming from a vantage point that uh, on other issues, may, we, we may have different views, um, but we share a common interest in stewardship, that those of us who had served in the, the armed forces um, had understood our role to be stewards, and what you're doing here is to be stewards. And I'm wondering if there were, if there are other angles like that, stewardship or other things that have brought together, kind of un strange bedfellows, unlikely alliances, uh, either uh, at Standing Rock or more your, your activism more broadly. So um, after the fight, the ground fight at Standing Rock was complete. One of the things I um, have we've continued to do is we're managing 800 legal cases, right? Um, and that is insane, you know, including myself. I got arrested too. 
Um, and it's a massive undertaking, but the, the, the issue of looking at North Dakota and what North Dakota is trying to do, they are trying to suppress free speech. So as these things are happening, the legislature is trying to pass bills where you can run over a protester and have no liability for that. I mean, literally kill someone. Um, they're, they're trying to pass laws where if you cause more than $1,000 of economic damage or the intent of causing $1,000 of economic damage to a business just by being in front of it, you can't protest there. They're going to create free speech zones. So, you know, you can't pick it in front of the building anymore. Um, and so the unlikely ally was me standing in front of the North Dakota legislature giving testimony about how they were suppressing free speech and then standing up next to the head of the AFL-CIO who got up there and talked about how his workers were the workers building the pipeline. There's no one more impacted by the demonstrations at Standing Rock than his organization and he absolutely supports a right to do it. You know, he absolutely supports the right to free speech because that impacts all of us. Um, you know, in this, this issue of, you know, stewardship, we all have a, we all need the planet. We all need clean water to drink. We all are un united by this. It should not be a partisan issue. It is not a political issue to want clean drinking water. It never should be. I mean, that is our future. Bob, one of these other moral precepts or concepts that can perhaps magnetically pull together people from left, right, center, or different corners in interesting ways is this notion that we spent some time yesterday talking about of responsibility. What does it mean to be responsible in concentric circles for self, for others, and so forth? And yeah. I'm wondering the, the, the ways in which um, the, the work that you do on the ground, um, uh, how you've tried to um, express the moral dimension of that work in ways that can bring people from left or right together to see that there's value in engaging um, in the um, in supporting the vo voice and power of um, uh, of poor people in this country, I, <clears throat> the biggest barrier that we face comes from left and right. When the left looks at poor people, they see a sea of victims, and when the right looks at poor people, they see a sea of aliens. There's an old African proverb that when bull elephants fight, the grass always loses, and that's true with poor people. Right now, a lot of my work is, is hampered by well-meaning people who are injuring with the helping hand. There's, there are two ways that you can deny people an opportunity to participate. One is to do it by law, as we had in segregation. But the other one that is much more lethal is to tell people that they don't have to compete. Because of histories of injustice, slavery, discrimination, <coughs> You know, uh, you, you have earned a pass that we as a society can't expect you to achieve. That if you shoot and kill one another, it's not your fault. If you drop out of school or in jail, it's not your fault. People are inspired to improve themselves when they are shown victories that are possible. Not just always reminding them of injuries to be avoided. And so what I try to do is inspire my folks, not through sermons, but by identifying witnesses, people that were down, who were faced with tremendous odds, but overcame those, and they become witnesses to the other. There's an old uh, a spiritual that used to be saying a lot in my, in my community, Lord, don't move the mountain. Give me the, the strength to climb. Don't remove the stumbling block. Give me the strength to go around. That's lost. That's called racist, if you say that to people. And that's what I'm fighting against, to, re to, to reach back to those times when conditions were racially hostile to us in the, in the 30s and 40s, but old people could walk in those communities without fearing their grandchildren. That's all changed today. So racism, so, so in other words, there's a lot that needs to be unpacked that is not being discussed at this conference. So one of the things that I, I would actually, um, I think one of the things that is really important to hear is that almost every one of the things that you just said um, are things that, with slightly different wording and maybe a slightly different tone, um, uh, in recent years, President Obama has said. And I think one of the things that is interesting and important right now is 
as I said last night, breaking out of the binary, right? And what you just described, Bob, is the, um, you know, you, you said you are beset in your work by, by both left and right. Um, and what you just described is the ways in which um, your efforts are beset by critics on the left. Um, there are, of course, critics or obstacles on the right that also, as you say, pose a challenge to bringing full dignity uh, to the poor that you're working with. Um, and naming those is as important. And one of the things that is hard to do, I think, for all of us, uh, and this is, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later in the panel that we have called Better Arguments, um, is actually occupying the other side's argument. Right? I actually, there, there, there's more than a little in what you said that I agree with, and I could make that argument in a way that would sound different from the way it sounded coming from someone who um, works with Paul Ryan, because I'm somebody who's worked with people on the other side, right? But we have to practice actually making those arguments from the other side, using the other side's language in ways that actually illuminate where there is, in fact, when you get out of the bull elephant, bull game of politics, what some of the common human challenges are here, right? And Jim, I want to um, close with you on this question. Um, I, I alluded earlier to this project uh, called Matthew 25. Um, and I would ask you to tell us, uh, first of all, what that passage of scripture says and why it is that you have felt in this um, moment uh, it's necessary to bring not only this text um, but this work to the wider world. I once uh, wrote a book called God's Politics, Why the Right Gets It Wrong and the Left Doesn't Get It, <laughs> which speaks to some of this stuff. Uh, this text is the Gospel of Matthew 25th chapter. Uh, I confronted this as a young secular student, having just shut down our universities back in 1970. I'm a lot older than many of you here. And uh, I was reading Ho Chi Minh, Karl Marx, and Che Guevara. And then I read this. Uh, and this is, gets the dignity question. Here's, here's Jesus in the text. Now, the church is very judgmental. Jesus usually isn't. But in this text, he is. He's sitting in judgment on those who would say they belong to him. And, and this is the famous text, some of you know, where he says, he lifts up the most vulnerable, and he says, as you've done to the least of these, you have done to me, to me. Now, that, that gives the dignity of, uh, in the Christian view, the dignity of the Son of God to those whom he's talking about. What Bob's talking about, the poor don't have any dignity. And it's true of the left all the time, liberal elites, the way they, okay. So then he says, uh, uh, I was hungry, uh, and you gave me food. Uh, and we, 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 we say, we're going to cut your nutrition programs to balance the budget. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Well, we'll take your water supply for a pipeline. Uh, I was a stranger. When Maria talked last night so personally and systemically about how she felt, how she felt about being demonized or an illegal alien. Uh, Jesus says, the stranger is the immigrant, is the refugee. You welcome me, you know, so we build a wall and deport fa families. And you go through that text, or I was in prison, uh, and you came to me. Well, uh, no, you built a mass incarceration system which continues slavery and disenfranchises a whole people. So, so this text now that I love, my conversion text, has become a pledge. It's rising up all around the country, among undocumented people, around pe people who are feeling on the other end of this. And so it's the Matthew 25 pledge, a commitment, very simple, to defend uh, and, and stand with uh, the most vulnerable. And there's web sojo.net, our website, you can find it, Matthew 25 uh, pledge, Dot com, but this is becoming a movement that doesn't deal with, it attacks politics, but it's not political. It's saying this is about, uh, it's theological, it's gospel, and how we treat those 
people that Jesus talks about is how we treat him. And there's, I've had Muslims send me the Quranic version of that text I've got now, and Jewish scholars, so, and even people who are not of faith are joining this movement. Matthew 25 pledges toolkits, and this is really to take on these issues from a moral and religious point of view. I want to close this conversation, actually, um, uh, Bob's uh, uh, insight and, and uh, friendly challenge, in a way, um, leads me to want to actually um, close with each of us saying really a word. I mean, like a word or two. And, and I'll start um, with a moral failing. What's a moral failing in each of us that, we are, that you're reckoning with as you try to do this work in the world? And I'll start. My moral failing is judgmentalness. I, I, it, it, it is, it is, that is my instinct. <laughs> uh, uh, and it takes intention to curb that instinct sometimes. Uh, but it's, a, it's an instinct that comes quick for me. Who else would like to? Cleansing myself of self-importance and see the beauty of God in the least of these. I'd have to say mine is probably anger. Um, so it is, it angers me to, you know, fight for the planet knowing we have renewables at our disposal, at our disposal. I, it just makes no sense. It angers me to be in a system that does not acknowledge the original people's lease lands. It's, it's hard to, to grapple with that anger and instead channel into change. Mm. Jim? Uh, I heard the word optimism a lot yesterday. And I'm not generally optimistic. In South Africa, though, I learned my theology of hope and how hope and optimism are different. Optimism is too weak, and I struggle with it a lot. Uh, it's about a feeling, a mood, a personality. Hope is a choice, a decision you make because of whatever you call faith. So I'm always struggling to move from lack of optimism to choosing hope because Hebrews says, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And my paraphrase of that that I always try to live, 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 live up to but struggle is, hope means believing in spite of the evidence, then watching the evidence change. That's what hope is. And I try to struggle every day toward that. Yes, sir. I would have to say my moral failing, among many other moral failings, <laughs> is um, exclusivity. Uh, I, I wish um, for myself and for others around me to practice the kind of radical inclusivity that involves recognizing who doesn't have a seat at the table and in conversations about the issues and values that matter to us. So uh, in a lot of my work, I'm, I'm driven by that desire to be more radically inclusive. Please join me in thanking our fantastic panelists this morning. Thank you. <laughs>